From being shot at by a sniper in a police situation to being swayed in a rip current into the ocean in La Jolla and never thinking I was going to come back to having a blood clot. When you're looking at possibly dying, that's the one thing you think about. Not, oh, I wish I had a better car. I wish I had a bigger house. Or I wish I could have gone to London. Wow, I wish I could have spent another hour with Mark. Welcome to We Do Hard Things, the show about facing fears, taking big risks, and chasing down dreams. I'm Mark Drager. And on today's show, how a radio DJ turned entrepreneur, found his true calling, faced death, and learned what really matters most in life. So if you were to grab your phone and scroll through your long list of apps, I'm holding my phone up right now. If you're anything like me, and millions of other people out there, you'd find Audible, the audiobook app. Now, if that is you, this isn't an ad for Audible. <laughs> the reason I'm saying this is because there's a really good chance you've already heard the voice of today's guest, Rob Actis. See, for years, he's been featured in national television commercials, but he's also the voice of Hal Elrod's wildly popular Miracle Morning audiobook series, amongst a ton of other titles. But before Rob was the best-selling author that he is today, before he was the host of Life Transformation Radio, even before he was the very first person to be nice to me on the social audio app Clubhouse, he was known as Mr. Action. Love that. It's a nickname, it turns out, he got as a young boy growing up in San Diego, California. My grandma branded me Mr. Action when I was like four or five years old. Really? She called me little Mr. Action. Yes. And I loved it because, you know, being a kid, five years old, I'm a mister. Like I was Mr. Action. And and I I loved it. And I I thought back, you know, after I wrote the book and people calling me Mr. Action. I'm, and then I went back and I discovered that that's when she started calling me that. And then I went back and listened to me on the radio. I was in radio in, for San, in San Diego for 15 years and my air checks. And I used to talk about action. I was involved in network marketing. I used to stand in front of the room and I had some videos and I used to talk. And then some people came out and said, man, you've been talking about action for so long. It was in the internet marketing space. And I was always talking about taking massive inspired action. And so, you know, people said, oh, you just came out with this. No, this has been my whole life. Like my whole life has been about taking action and moving forward. And no matter what obstacle came in my way, I just like, okay, pivot, shift, and go do something else. But I, I've always been moving in a in a velocity that most people like they can't understand. Do you think when your grandma started calling you Mr. Action and you put that on and you wore that and you're like, I'm oh, Mr. Action, do you think that turned you into the action taker? Or do you think she saw something within you and branded you that way? I think she saw something in me. I remember as a child, man, I went to the beat of my own drum. I mean, if you saw my family, my family looks at me and they're like, what planet did you land from? I'm not at all like my family at, at all. Um, on my dad's side and my mom's side, I'm really not at all. People are like, this is your family? Like, they're so different. They're, they're employees. They're not entrepreneurial. Um, they're very calm, very just, you know, easygoing, um, not not any way loud or aggressive or, or anything like that. And just not super passionately driven. They don't have a lot of passion. My family's not a really passionate family. Are you and here I am. That? I mean, like they, they might hear you say these things like, or do you, are you I, I don't willing care. to tell no, them? No, 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 no. I, th well, they know that, that I'm, I'm like not the black sheep, but I'm like the purple sheep of the family and that I'm just not the same. And it's great because everybody has their lane. I found my lane early on and I was always the leader. I mean, I remember I used to hold court when I was four or five years old. I remember standing in front of the TV when Laugh-In was on and Gary Owens goes, why from downtown Burbank? You know, it's a Laugh-In. And I turned around in front of the TV and they're like, get out of the way, get out of the way. I'm like, I want to talk on TV. Like how does someone who's four or five years old know that they want to talk on TV. I mean, I didn't know what that entailed, but when I was six, seven, eight years old, I started really playing like I was on the radio and I got older. And at 15, 16 years old, I met up 
with someone who was a disc jockey at a radio station and I was at the radio station. So I've always had this forward momentum that's been pretty remarkable. Do you think that as a child, we have these dreams and wishes and ambitions that we distract ourselves with other things and bury? And then at a certain age, you just spend the rest of your life trying to become the person you wish you were as a kid. And the reason I ask that is because I can remember being a kid and watching a commercial or watching kind of like Disney on ice or something. And there were camera operators standing behind broadcast cameras. After film school, I worked in television as a camera operator on our national news. And I'd be camera operating or I'd be teleprompting. And I remember standing there at one point going like, oh, geez, I wished I could do this as a kid. And now I'm doing it. I can remember sitting, I had a Mickey Mouse record player. Like when I say Mickey Mouse, I mean like it was a plastic record player with Mickey Mouse on it. And my mom uh, gave me that. some- I had, you, I had that. I my did. Mom, my mom gave me some old 45s and I used to play like, um, it's my party and I could cry if I want to. And towards the end, um, I would try and figure out, because I didn't have two record players. I couldn't figure out how to like bridge and lead into the next one to like hit the post, right? Like, like right. I was doing all these things as kids to try and be like, okay, how many seconds do you have before the singing starts that you could talk over to like, to like lead up and stuff. And, you know, when I used to listen to talk radio, I would just think deep within myself, like I could do this so much better than they're doing it. And then I went off and I did all these other things. And now at this age, I'm just thinking like secretly, oh, I wish I could do all of those things. <laughs> so, so do you think that most of us just spend our life, you know, we have these childhood ambitions and then we do other things and then we spend the rest of our life trying to seek those things back out secretly? I've met a lot of people that are doing exactly what they wanted to do when they were a child. They just said, look, I'm going to be a fireman. And they're a fireman. Mm. And I think what happens is someone in our, our life, probably a family member, says, you can't do that. And I think it has an impact. I mean, I, I, I was just upstairs before I got in here in the, in the guest room. I have a, a painting that I did when I was in second grade. And it's amazing. It's of a, of a tiger. And I look at it on a daily basis. And it's framed and it's beautiful. It's one of the few things that I have as a child. And what's amazing about it is that the layering, I'm going to send you a picture of it. The layering of it is amazing. So there's, it's painted. I was probably six or seven years old. And the tiger is inside the grass. So like I have layers of that. I could never recreate that now as an adult. Someone, I just know because... I don't trust my art ability, paint to, to draw to any of that stuff. It just doesn't feel right. And I'm like, how did I do that? And what person told me that it wasn't very good and I'm not an artist. And then it, it triggered in my brain. I'm not an artist, but uh, you could pay me a million dollars and I couldn't recreate that piece of art. And it's amazing to me how conversation can have such an impact on, on children. It's just, you know, they're so open to everything. And that's the one thing that I think that, that I love about me is that I always have this childlike wonder, like curious. And I still, at, at my age now, I'm like, I'm just curious. I just, I have that childlike wonder. And I think that's amazing. I think what happens is it gets crushed when we're kids. And unfortunately, then they get in the status quo and you start getting in line. I've always been one who tends to be out of the lines and, and tends to, you know, not, not go to the beat of everyone's drum. I went to the beat of Rob's drum. And I, I, I think it's, it's just sad that people will inadvertently just make a comment to a child of like, that's not very good. You can't do that. You're not this. Because I think it happens really young that we decide what we want to be. Like, like you, playing the records and, and then it gets, you know, Oh, you need to, you know, you get a job and do this and you can't do this or whatever. So. Did you go through the dip where you try to do other people's stuff and then go, this, this is just not me and then break free. Or were you able to protect that childlike curiosity and the beat of your own drug throughout? I moved out of the house when I was uh, 15 years old, mm. um, bad Why? home life, um, really bad home life, had a stepdad that was incredibly, um, abusive emotionally, like incredibly abusive. And then he had a mother who lived there and she used to hit me with a switch all the time. And so I just had to get out of there. So my, my amazing older sister, Anita, 
um, let me come live with her. Oh my goodness. Um, Your story is like my mom remarried. My yeah. stepfather uh, had mental health issues and was an alcoholic. I left when I was just turned 16 because it's when I could legally live, leave. Yeah. Yeah. And I moved out yeah. with my sister. I didn't have a, you know, I, I had a challenging childhood. And so I lived with my sister and um, it was a crazy tumultuous time. Her husband uh, was an alcoholic. Mm. Um, I was there. I didn't get to do a lot of fun stuff in school because I worked. I worked to provide to be there at, at that young of an age. And, um, you know, I got a lot of my work ethic, I think, from that. And um, it was perfect. I, I can't, I would never change anything that happened in my past because it's perfect for where I am today. It has made me who I am. I am so incredibly strong. I've been through some serious, crazy things in my life that I've survived from being shot at by a sniper in a police situation to having a 357 Magnum put to my forehead in an armed robbery to being swept away in a rip current into the ocean in La Jolla and never thinking I was going to come back to having a blood clot. Um, just crazy stuff that's happened in my life. And I, I look at everything as like, okay, this is the movie. So the movie of my life was I moved out. I then got a job at a grocery store and I had a crush on this cashier named Vicky. Oh my God. She was so beautiful. Just, oh my God. Oh my God. I loved it. And then here I find out Vicky. Oh, remember Vicky. She's a DJ at a radio station. And I'm like, you know, 16, have a crush on her. And she's a DJ. And I start telling her how much I want to be on radio. And she goes, Hey man, come up and visit me. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> oh, wow. Like, Oh, wow. And so I went up there and she showed me a production room and she let me play in the, in the studio. And I, it was amazing. It was just to be in that environment. Like, yeah, this is what I want to do. This is, this is what I want to do. And had all these things happen in my life, I might be in a different path. You know, had I not gone here, or done this, and it's all the left and the right and the decisions. And I always had a lot of intentional stuff of what I wanted to do. Even the point of when I was 18 years old, I moved to Colorado because my friend who had a company was buying a radio station in Colorado Springs and I was going to get to work at the radio station. So I just, you know, went, did this. I even quit a job making $6,000 a month selling copiers at Minolta to go work for $4 an hour, 10 hours a week at a radio station. Hmm. Like that... I've always wanted to be in radio. That's what I wanted to do. And I've always maybe got off track. I'm like, yeah, I got a lot of money, but that's not what I'm going to do. So I always kept coming back. When I go off track, things go haywire. Man, when I'm right in my lane of using my voice and inspiring people or, or, or you know, it, it, exciting them or, or leading them and using my voice and, and entertaining them, it's just effortless. It's just magic. So I, I, yeah. we're going we're gonna, like we're gonna to dig into this a little bit, but I got to ask, all right, what yeah. led to you being shot at by a sniper? I, I see this all the time. There's police activity and people tend to go towards it. I'm the opposite. I go away from it because I was in um, Pacific beach. It was the borderline Pacific beach, mission beach in San Diego. And I heard all this commotion and um, I heard gunfire. And there was a sniper on this apartment, on this, uh, on this hotel or apartment building in, in there. And people are, you know, they're all these police and they're behind the cars and stuff. And I wandered over because my curiosity was like, what's going on? And I remember the police officer pulling me down and it shot the car. Like it shot the car. And that's not the only time. It's amazing because um, in radio, we were at, um, we were on the, the light against crime. And I was with um, Gail Stewart, who was a, a reporter. And um, we were going through a, a challenging part of, of, of San Diego, a lot of gang activity. Um, we could see people walking down the streets with uh, artillery. I would call it artillery. And, um, we get shot at. It was amazing. And so like, it, it's, it's very interesting how all that stuff. So now two things about me, 
if someone's in need, I will be the one, like I've run into a fire and I don't like fire. I pull people out of a building when a house is on fire. I will run towards like, if there's an, if there's something happening right now in front of me, I will be that person that gets involved to help. I'm extremely calm. However, if there's something that's already happening and there's police activity, I go the other way. I have no intention. I have no curiosity. I don't need to be there. I can't do anything to help. I don't need to be there. So I learned this great lesson. Now it took me getting shot at, but I eventually learned. And a lot of people don't think of the consequences of their actions. And I see it all the time. They, they go towards police activity and it doesn't help and it's dangerous. And, you know, there's, there's a time and a place of curiosity and that from, from real life experience, not a good place to be curious. So I don't know if you noticed, but Rob kind of just, he, he rhymed off all these crazy life stories being shot at by a sniper now that that's not your everyday experience being held hostage in an armed robbery and having had the chance to get to know rob like really get to know him i know how eye-opening of an experience it was for him to be stricken with a life-threatening blood clot and of course there's never a good time in your life to be rushed to the hospital to deal with an illness like that but all this actually came at the heels of his daughter's own life-threatening battle. My daughter, um, June 8th, 2013, suffered four strokes, had to have brain surgery, was in a coma, had a 4% chance of survival. It was terrible. It was, it was absolutely How old was terrible. She? We're, she was 14. 14. So coming up on eight year anniversary of her survival. And- Your only um, daughter? My only daughter. Yeah, my only daughter, Aiden. And it was, it was devastating. And the one thing we discovered is that I gave her something called Leiden Factor 5. And Leiden Factor 5 is a blood clotting disorder, which attributes to blood clots. So she had a blood clot. I got really big. So I'm 190 pounds. I'm 5'10", 190 pounds. I'm in, really, I'm in good shape. Um, in the hospital, all I needed to do was eat. Like I, talk, I shot video. I talked to my daughter. I took pictures. I captured the moment and I ate a lot. And I got up to like 239, 240 pounds. I got kind of big. And um, I was thinking, I don't feel good. I can't take care of my family this way because I'm just kind of, bleh. I just felt blah. And I decided to do something about it. I, I made a, a decision. I got a flyer and I said, I'm going to this gym. It was an MMA gym. It was owned by um, UFC fighter Ryan Bader. And um, I went in there. I'm not an athlete in any way, shape, or form. I've never been athletic. When people saw that I was going to an MMA gym, they laughed. They, they just like, yeah, okay. Well, I signed up. I did a Muay Thai class. I made it through about nine minutes of the warm up. I thought I was going to die. But I was so committed to, to getting myself self in perfect shape and health because I wanted to be there for my then wife, my ex, now ex-wife and my daughter, because I'm like, I'm going to die. I'm just overweight. I'm not healthy. I don't feel good. This is not how I'm going to provide for my family. This is just not a good idea. So I decided, I plan, I act, I took massive action. I got a trainer. Um, my 10 minute, my 12 minutes to 15 minutes to 20 minutes. I started doing an hour of Muay Thai. I had a trainer three days a week, a month in, I, I noticed that there was a, uh, boxing before the Muay Thai class. I'm like, well, that looks fun. And I started boxing. I couldn't get through the work, the warm up, but then eventually. And so a couple months into it, I was doing an hour of Muay Thai, an hour of boxing and five hours of, of uh, training of, you know, an hour a day of training. Like I was doing a lot of training, got down to 200 pounds. He told me I was going to get 200 pounds. I go, there's no way. There's just no way. There's just no way. And I got to 200 pounds. I was in incredible shape. Remember, I'm not an athlete. I don't claim to be an athlete. I've never been athletic. I don't know. I don't know what I don't know. And I had a Charlie horse in my leg for months during all this time. I was doing kickboxing. I was getting kicked in the, in the, in the calf. Um, I was rubbing it out with one of those roller bars. I was doing deep tissue massage because I'm telling my trainer, man, I got a Charlie horse. My leg's really hurting. Yeah, we'll work it out. Well, 
my daughter, Aiden, was saying, Dad, you have a blood clot. I don't have a blood clot. Yeah, you do. I go, I don't. You have Leiden factor five. You know, you gave it to me. And I said, I have a blood clot. I ignored it for months. And then the universe said, hey, Rob, you're not paying attention. We're giving you all these clues and hints that you need to change your life. But you thought I was changing my life. I was getting healthy. I thought I was working out. Yeah. I was doing all the right things. But I wasn't, I wasn't living the life that I was supposed to be living. And um, I ended up in the hospital, in the ER. I was in the most incredible pain that I could ever imagine. And I had a feeling like, um, Rob, you're going to die. Like, this is the end of your life. You're going to die. Why? Why did you think that? I have no idea. Like, I don't even know how to explain the experience of like, I just felt like this is the end. Like, that's a weird thing. Like, okay, you're, you're, you're going to die. Of all the things that have near death experiences, I never, ever felt I was going to die. Never. I mean, even when I was in the, the rip current and I was, I was thinking, oh my God, I'm going to die. I thought I was going to die. When I had my blood clot, I felt like I was going to die. That was a very scary place to be. Mm -hmm. And the doctor looks at me and he said, Rob, this is really bad. He said, I don't even know how you're alive. I go, what? He goes, you have a blood clot. And so in my mind, a blood clot is a little teeny, just a little, little teeny thing, right? Yeah. I said, it's just a little small. Just fix it. He goes, you've had this for a long time. It goes from your hip, a solid mass down to your ankle. The fact you even have a leg is remarkable. And so I'm thinking, all right, wheel me into the hospital, fix me up and boom, boom, boom. He goes, we're going to send you home. And I go, oh, so it's not that bad. No, it's really bad. He goes, you honestly could die, you know, pretty much at any time. And I'm like, oh, so you're going to send me home. And I'm going to die. He said, well, we're going to be some blood thinners and you're just not going to do anything for a while. We're going to get you uh, transported to uh, a vein specialist and we're going to take some more deep look at it and figure out what we're going to do here. Um, but he said, you got to do nothing. I said, what does that mean? He said, well, if, if something dislodges, um, it's going to go to your heart or lungs. And I go, so then I just come to the ER and he goes, yes. And they're probably just going to prepare for your death. You're either going to have a massive stroke or you're just going to die. And I'm like to myself, I have a daughter, my only daughter who I am committed to the bottom core of my being to be here and to take care of and to support. I'm like, I'm not dying. I'm not dying. And so I took massive inspired action and I did exactly what they told me to do. The only thing I didn't do that they told me to not do was I picked up my daughter from school and dropped her off. And I wasn't supposed to do that. So when you and say didn't do anything, like you, you, li you I laid in bed. bed with my, that's what I did. That's what, what, was did, my what did you do for all those months? You just read and poked around online. I just read. Or? No, there, no, I didn't. I just laid in bed. I just thought the one thing that's amazing. And I don't know how this happened. I did a miracle morning book. Um, I don't remember which one it was, but one of the books I did during so that when, time. When you, hold on. When you say you did it for everybody who's watching, for everyone who's listening, you like, you're a professional voiceover person. So yeah. So I'm the narrator for all of Hal Elrod's Miracle Morning books. Yeah. So if you and go so to Audible the books, and, and listen, yeah, that's yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, that's me. Yeah. So I don't know which one it was, but I remember um, my, my friend, Robert, um, who's now passed, um, he was trying to figure out, I'm trying to figure out how I can lay and do the book. And so we jammy rigged it so I could have my leg elevated and it wasn't going to work. And so I did the book and I did it for like 10 minutes at a time, 15 minutes at a time, and then took an hour break. And it's amazing. I, I, was, on, I was on drugs at the time. So um, I wasn't feeling a whole lot of pain, but I did the book. It's just amazing. Like it just made, I think back to it. And I'm like, oh my God, I did a miracle morning book when I was freaking. Uh, yeah. So the one thing that I did is I also used my brain. There's a reason all this stuff happened. This is the final thing. Like you're meant to be here. Like, there's a reason you're here. You better step up your life. Just doing TV commercials is not it. The Miracle Morning, that's great. That makes a significant impact. But you need to be sharing your message. People have always said that I was inspirational and stuff. And now 
I had to trust it and really do that. And I found out that I resonated, my voice resonated with people and had an impact. And that was the turning point. Rob's turning point was his blood clot. The very thing that cost him so much, so much time lost, so much energy spent, the worry, the pain, the really hard thing he had to face. Now, in my experience, when people, maybe even yourself, are forced to face these challenges, to dig deep and to do what's needed just to get through, just to survive. When you find yourself in those moments of clarity, I'm sure you're left asking, why am I doing this? Does any of this, does any of this even matter? Do I love it? Am I passionate about my work? Am I spending my time with the right people on the right things? I don't know about you, but that's what comes to my mind when I hear Rob's story. And so honestly, I put it to him directly, like big picture. Everything he's telling me, everything he's telling us makes sense. But in the day to day, in real life, can you really Live your life doing what you love. You may die. And the world got the reality of that with the pandemic. The whole freaking world stopped. And it's so important to learn from these moments that we don't have all these other redos. And we don't have any guarantee that tomorrow is going to happen. We have no guarantee. And it's so important that you cherish every moment of your life and live every moment like you want to be alive and do what you want to do and be with the people you want to be with. That's all there is. You don't want to have regrets when I was laying in bed. I'm like, oh my God, I didn't get to see this person another time. Am I going to see my daughter again? Even when she would go to school, am I going to see her again? So, Hellos and goodbyes, they're along with me. And I let everybody know how much they mean to me. Stuff doesn't mean anything. Experiences are great. But all we have is the people in our lives. When you're looking at possibly dying, that's the one thing you think about. Not, oh, I wish I had a better car. I wish I had a bigger house. Or I wish I could have gone to London. Wow, I wish I could have spent another hour with Mark. Wish I could have spent another hour with my daughter. We only have one life and we have to live it every day. Like we want to be alive. We always think, oh, there's always tomorrow. There's not. And the greatest thing is I don't want anybody to ever feel like they're going to die. And all the other people that share their stories, they don't want anyone to experience what they did, but they want to do is they want to inspire and motivate people to get the big picture that life is precious and that we have to cherish every single moment and learn from my life experience or other people's life experiences so you don't have to have that happen. The feeling of almost dying, it sucks. It sucks. Life is so so short and so freaking precious. And most of us, and I'll admit I was as well, and we take everything for granted. Do stuff now and do what's important. And what's important is people in your life and all the other stuff, it's not important. What does scare you? Like at, at this point in your journey, in your life, what are the things that you're actually afraid of? I'm terribly afraid of heights. I try to overcome that fear um, often. I, d- I didn't expect that, to, yeah. that answer, to be honest with you. <laughs> well, that's, that's one of my big fears is heights. And it, it, it drives me because I always try to, like I was on a ladder the other day and people were like, oh my God, you're on a ladder. So I almost fell off a building when I was in radio and I was grabbed by the legs and I was over a three-story building. So it had an impact on me on, on heights. Daughter, Again, another, it, another throwaway story there where you're like, when oh, I was sorry, in radio, sorry. I was pushed off yeah, a building. No, Someone dangled yeah. no me I wasn't pushed stories. off a building. I just, I just grabbed a balloon. I just grabbed a balloon. But yeah, so my fear is that my daughter Aiden doesn't have the extraordinary life that I want her to have. That's probably my biggest fear. And I, I don't really focus on things that scare me because... I, I really work hard 
to have really pure thoughts. And I believe with intention that what you think can happen. And that's a very positive thing. So I don't dwell on negative things that happen. I'm very positive. I don't dwell on negative. So it was a big reach for me to have to dig deep. And I answered the fear of heights. And then I'm like, okay, I got to get a little more uncomfortable. But you know, a lot of people go through life and like, I'm afraid something's going to happen. I'm afraid something's going to happen. And they're afraid of this, afraid of that. That's not how I roll. That's not how I am. I try to be in the very, very present moment like right now, right here. And so I don't have a lot of that fear of a lot of stuff that's going to happen because I'm here right now. You know, ultimately, and I've spoken about this on a few episodes now, you know, I've, I've read the book, The Five Regrets of the Dying by Bonnie Ware. And it's remarkable. It's, it's remarkable to speak to people who've had experiences like you, to be able to read about people who are on their deathbed and have these regrets, have these moments of clarity, have these moments of truth where they say, I wish I didn't care so much about what other people thought. I wish I spent more time doing the things I loved. I wish I spent more this, more this, more this, didn't focus here, there, whatever it is. What's curious to me is it feels like a truth and it sounds like a truth and it looks like a truth. And when you're facing death, I'm sure it snaps into reality what's important, what's really important. Yeah. I'm curious whether I can learn, like you've said, from someone like you, from your experiences, if I believe you and if I trust you, can I accept these things as truth without having to experience them? And if I can move forward as if they're true, will it actually happen? Yes. You know, that's, that's, that's the experiment like over the next six months or year that I'm even going to be playing out. I invite you to try on the jacket of people that have faced near death because the reason they're so passionate about sharing their story is because they want people to really understand how important it is that you can have it happily ever after and overcome adversity and how important it is to live every moment. And because there's no guarantee. A lot of these things that have happened to people, they happen in a split second. I've been playing this game with people now and it's really, they're very uncomfortable about it. They don't like it when I say it. Imagine you're sitting in a chair and you receive a phone call and the phone call says, you have 60 minutes to live, choose wisely. What's important now? It's, I, I invite anybody to try that. Puts a lot of things in perspective of what's important in your life and what's not important in your life. And I can almost guarantee you, the majority of people will find the people that they love the most and they will spend every freaking moment with them. And that shows how important balance is in your life. Working all the time is not the answer. Having that balance. And if you want to know what's important in your life, do that. Sit in a chair, receive a phone call, and be told you have 60 minutes. And then you're gone. Choose wisely. Choose wisely. Oh, man. You know, over the past few months, Rob really has become a friend. So I want to thank you, Mr. Action, for your encouragement, for your raw honesty, and for the amazing energy you bring to everything that you do. Okay, changing gears a little bit. Three takeaways from this conversation. Number one, everything good that's happened to you. And yes, everything bad that's also happened to you is part of your story. It's shaped you. It's molded you into the person that you are today. And if you choose to look at it in the right light, there's a reason behind everything that's happened to you. Number two, the universe, God, whatever faith you believe in, it gives you hints on where you should be, what you're supposed to be doing, and who you're supposed to be with. So it's important not only to stay open to these hints and these signs, but also to remember that with intention, anything is possible. So chase down those hints, try things, and see where it takes you. And number three, I so love the question that Rob posed. Imagine you get that call. You only have 60 minutes. What do you prioritize? What do you let go of? That little exercise it shows you what really matters most to you 
Now, you don't have to wait for that call to prioritize the things in your life that are most important to you. Now, if you have something to prove to the doubters, to the haters, to that little voice of fear that screams at you from the back of your mind, if that is you, you've got to face the hard and scary and difficult things in your life. It's not easy. It's never easy. But remember, we aren't just dreamers. We're doers because we do hard things. If you've ever felt like you're not good enough, like you weren't born with the right skills or gifts, or you just don't have what it takes to get ahead, you've got to hear how this author breaks down everything we thought we knew about personalities and limiting beliefs. Click on the video right over there to hear this real inspiring conversation.